We recently bought and reviewed the Asus ROG Ally RC71L-Ally period Z1X underscore 512, also known as the ROG Ally. It's a handheld from Asus and it has a custom 7840U-ish APU in it from AMD, and that chip is known as the Z1 Extreme. We also just bought the Asus ROG RC71L-Ally period Z1 underscore 512, also known as the ROG Ally. Confusingly, even though there's one letter of difference hidden in there, uh, these are actually very different devices. And so we're testing the lower end one today. This is the non-extreme version, and it's a really interesting use case for GPU busy, but also just for benchmarking because it's a $100 difference between these. So 700 versus 600 for the non-extreme version. And the question we seek to answer is simply whether or not it's worth it to save $100 in exchange for whatever the performance loss is. So uh, on paper, it's a large difference. There are fewer CPU cores and threads at six cores and 12 threads versus eight and 16. It has lower CPU boost clocks at 4.9 gigahertz versus 5.1. And most significantly, it has fewer Radeon 3 CUs at four versus 12. So the lower end one is running four CUs at only 2.5 gigahertz for advertised clocks instead of 2.7. So review should be really interesting even if you're not interested in buying one of these devices. And that is specifically, once again, because we can use some new metrics to try and determine how well balanced they are and if AMD and ASUS have done well to couple the right CPU and GPU pairing with those cut downs. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace and visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, including our recently launched gamers.nexus site, where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. I built this site personally in a couple of hours by using Squarespace's Fluid Engine to move blocks around visually until I liked it. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools, and of course we built a website for our CEO Snowflake because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash or click the link below. We're going to skip all the features and all the mechanical stuff that we already reviewed with the Asus ROG Ally Z1 Extreme, and that is because it's all the same, basically. So uh, we already took it apart. We showed the teardown. We actually really liked the assembly disassembly process, and we also talked about acoustics in depth. We did thermals, power, everything, and that's all in the base review, which is linked below. The focus here today is strictly on these two devices. So the Steam Deck's not present either. That's also in the previous one. Uh, and additionally, the testing from today is not directly comparable to the last testing we did because we've made some changes in the game settings. Since this is purely a head-to-head, -head, we can kind of do whatever we want. We don't have to worry about fitting within the parameters of the smallest screen size device or screen resolution device. And additionally, we've done some updates to the games, updates to uh, the BIOS, all that stuff. All of the parameters have been modified in some way, so not directly comparable. Now, the Z1's potential advantage here is that both systems share the same power profiles, or at least the same TDP labels on the screen for those power profiles. So the hardware specs may not come into play if they're sufficiently power limited. To recap, there's Silent, which ASUS calls 10 watts, performance, which they call 15 watts, and turbo at 25 watts or turbo at 30 watts. By default, performance mode is applied on battery power, and turbo 30 watt is applied when connected to a 65 watt charger. So these are the modes we'll be using for comparison. Now, critically, the wattages used to label these power profiles don't equal real world power draw, and we wouldn't compare them between devices if the devices in comparison weren't two SKUs of the same model. In other words, if a totally different device from let's say Gigabyte comes out and they have their own 15 watt, 25 watt, 30 watt tiers, uh, it, it's not gonna be the same. It's extremely unlikely they are identical. These numbers can be tweaked and they don't necessarily represent the real power consumption. So it's not necessarily fair to put those two on the chart and claim that they're both the same power. You can put them on the same chart and say they're different modes but it doesn't, you would need the battery life consumption to have the full picture of it, or just a direct tap to the battery. Some testing methodology notes as we jump into this. So STAPM is a limiting factor, and uh, that is the skin temperature aware management of the clocks and the boosting. And we're gonna talk about that as we get through this. 
uh, it affects some games, and so we would run the games at a steady state as well. So what we're talking about is after a couple minutes of using these devices, there's a chance, depending on the workload, that STAPM limits kick in and start throttling the device. So you may see that after a couple minutes, you may see it nearly instantaneously, but ultimately, because gaming is mostly done for periods longer than, let's say, two or three minutes, we did the majority of our testing after those limits applied. In other words, with both devices at steady state under whatever restrictions they face at the three minute mark, that's when most of these kick in uh, with the workloads we're using today. And so that allows us to see what's the sort of realistic, you're actually playing the game, not just testing it. We also have the, you're just testing it for a shorter window benchmarks in here, and we mark them both so you know which is which. For other notes on the versioning, so both of these use the latest BIOS and updates that shipped on September 26th, and it's currently uh, October 3rd, and there's nothing newer out there. Those shipped through Armory Crate, MyAsus, and Windows Update. Uh, this includes the latest public BIOS 323. The non-extreme is different, though. This reports that BIOS was updated to 323 in both Windows and MyAsus, but Hardware Info reports BIOS version 324, which isn't a version available through the ASUS website or mentioned anywhere, at least at the time of writing this. Now, the next BIOS version should be 330, and we, we don't know if this will be included in it, but totally separately from this, our understanding is that AMD is currently working on some tuning to try and address the frame time pacing issues that we saw in our first review. So we received some contact from people familiar with it uh, who saw the frame time pacing issues that we we wrote about and showed in our video, and that's supposed to be getting addressed, but that's not available right now, and we don't know when it will be or if it'll be included in patch 330. The FPS numbers we're going to discuss here are lower than we would typically see in a CPU or a GPU review for a discrete component. So what matters is going to be the percentages for relative scaling. We're going to focus on those, uh, and the changes that appear in terms of small FPS can be large once you look at a percent number, and that scales fairly linearly. So if you adjust your settings to where now you're at 60 FPS or 40 or whatever, uh, 80, that percent scaling will apply pretty evenly there too. Now for that, let's get into the game benchmarks. Starting with the F122 using the high preset, the Z1 non-extreme on battery averaged 31 FPS with disappointingly bad 0.1% lows. Maybe AMD's rumored Z1 updates will help resolve this, but the latest BIOS didn't fix anything, and for now, this is the performance. That non-extreme average increased to 36 FPS with wall power, a 15% uplift. Looking purely at averages, the Z1 Extreme has a 27% advantage on battery, that's huge, and a 63% advantage on wall power. But we also confirmed across multiple runs that the Z1 Extreme's performance drops after the first one or two passes on battery power due to hitting STAPM, or again, skin temperature aware power management limits. Still, even isolating our comparison to the steady state FPS passes on battery power, meaning at those limits, gives the Extreme a 21% advantage. Lows were better on both handhelds when connected to wall power, but still bad as compared to desktop proportional scaling we expect, or even the scaling on the Steam Deck. On the Z1 Extreme, averaging all of our test passes results in 39.8 FPS average, about 8.4% higher than the 36.7 number that we get by averaging only the later limited passes. The Z1 only moved from 31.4 to 30.4, or about a 3% uplift when including the pre-limit results in the average. While testing F1, we took the opportunity to do a quick battery life comparison between the Z1 and the Z1 Extreme. We looped the in-game benchmark with the same settings we used for the performance test. We're not worried about maximizing the battery life here, we're just comparing the two systems. Both systems used the default performance power profile labeled 15 watts, and both systems have identical listed battery capacities. You can get more depth in our standalone review. But under these conditions, the Z1 Extreme lasted 92 minutes and the Z1 lasted 102 minutes, an 11% extension in battery life under load for the less powerful processor. That makes sense. Red Dead Redemption 2's presets take the form of a slider. We maxed out the lowest favored performance tier and applied FSR 2.0 quality. That's a source resolution of 720p upscaled to the 1080p native resolution of the Allies display. The regular Z1 averaged 32 FPS, had battery power, but showed little improvement on wall power, giving the Extreme's 38.2 FPS average a 21% advantage on battery 
and 61% on wall power, where it ran 53 FPS average. However, this is the second of two titles that we saw in our test suite, along with F122, where we had a significant performance degradation on the extreme after sustained testing. At steady state, the extreme's advantage drops to only 10% over the non-extreme at 33.1 FPS average from 38.2. Including the pre-limit results may only change the average by 5 FPS, but that's a 15% uplift over the more realistic average of just steady state STAPM limited passes. Our Phantom Liberty benchmark measures performance on a busy street in Dogtown. We used the low non-ray tracing preset with FSR 2.1 enabled and manually set it to quality. Again, with 1080p native resolution on the Ally, quality means a 720p source. There's a Steam Deck preset available as well, but it raises several settings above the low preset and it pushes FSR to auto, so we didn't use it. With our settings, the Z1 averaged 21 FPS on battery power, which climbed 25% to 27 FPS on wall power. Again, the extreme is ahead in both scenarios, by 18% on battery and 58% on wall power. This testing was done at STAPM steady state meaning we were already at the STAPM limits for the most realistic use case, because a user wouldn't play a game for only a few minutes, so the tests reflect the more likely longer period gaming use. Here's a look at the STAPM limit in Cyberpunk. There was no significant performance degradation over the course of Cyberpunk testing for either device in our logged passes, but it is possible to create that situation. This chart shows a cold launch of Cyberpunk 2077, followed by four passes of Phantom Liberty benchmarking done as quickly as possible, indicated by the latter four bumps in GPU utilization. As you can see, the STAPM limit isn't fully reached until partway through the second run. Clocks boost up above 2.5 GHz on the GPU initially, then drop abruptly when the limit is hit. That's approximately three minutes after launching the game. And Actually, that's around the same time it took us to see the uh, temperature drop when we were doing our thermal testing previously, and it aligns with when the fans ramp. So it's dropping power and ramping fans at the same time. The FPS logs of these particular test passes, not the ones used for the bar chart, reflect that performance loss. We're plotting against GPU frequency since that's the most obvious loss, but CPU speed is reduced as well. For the benchmark shown in this review today, other than F1 and Red Dead, all of the results represent the steady state performance, meaning after these drops happen. We had high hopes for Baldur's Gate 3 on the Ally, given how well it performed on seven-year-old GPUs like the GTX 1060. Unfortunately, even at 1080p using the low preset, we saw extreme hitching in our test area. The Z1 Extreme has its usual advantage over the non-extreme here, but the frame time spikes are terrible across the board. Switching to Vulkan on the extreme didn't change average performance, but it appeared to mildly reduce hitching on some individual passes sometime. We know that Baldur's Gate 3 can be made to be playable on these handheld devices, and we'll look at it separately for the Steam Deck in our next GPD review, but here it's just it's getting close, but the frame times are just too bad. AMD's updates we've heard of should improve much of this behavior, but we don't know when they'll arrive. If they're promising enough, we may revisit as a standalone once they post. With that in mind, we reran our Baldur's Gate tests at the same low preset, but with Vulkan and FSR 1.0 quality enabled. Baldur's Gate 3 lacks FSR 2. The Extreme's heavily power-limited performance on battery didn't change at all versus the 1080p DX11 test, other than a slight improvement in 0.1% lows. But the Z1 did improve, and this is the one instance where we saw it tie the extreme. The lows are worse on the non-extreme, but only on average. Both had some individually extremely terrible passes. The gap was also smaller than usual on wall power, with the extreme only 11% ahead. There are other issues with this game. We'll look at some frame time data and our newly introduced GPU Busy metric. We've detailed the metric a few times now, but our most detailed look was an interview with Tom Peterson. You can check that out on the channel if you're unfamiliar with it. Starting with the Z1 non-extreme, we can see on this particular test pass that there was one exceptionally bad frame beyond the scale of this chart, and that one hit 322 milliseconds. That's the one that blew out the average, partly at least, and the scale of this chart. In Counter-Strike 2, 322 milliseconds without any measure of repeatability would still be game ruining. That's a third of a second that you're staring at an old frame. In Baldur's Gate 3, it's annoying, but it won't cause you to miss a shot between doors on mid or something like that. GPU active time spiked in tandem, but only to 72 milliseconds, so that's 22% of the total frame time here, indicating a bind elsewhere. This is in contrast to several other spikes where the GPU is active for the majority of the frame time, 
indicating a direct GPU bind. The worst of the frame times seem to be related to something other than the GPU, so that's the CPU or memory or cache, while the average frame times are often fully leveraging the GPU. Here's the extremes plot. The test pass we selected for the extreme isn't much different in terms of average, 1% and 0.1%, but the raw frame time plot is. Notice that the GPU active line is more distant from the overall frame time line, indicating a shift towards a non-GPU bind. This starts to answer part of why the difference between these two devices isn't as large in this game. The difference matters a lot more when we're fully GPU bound. This is exactly where GPU Busy is used best. In a complete system, we need to know how well a company balanced its part choices. GPU Busy answers that question. Every system will be bottlenecked on something, but the balance is what matters. The Z1 Extreme here is underutilizing its GPU for Baldur's Gate 3, with these settings at least, meaning that there is a bind on the CPU component. They're not far off though, so overall this is balanced in this game relatively, because something has to be overloaded. It's just the GPU is not getting utilized as much, which means the extra performance of the more expensive one is a little bit wasted here. In Dying Light 2, we used the low preset with FSR quality upscaling. The non-extreme started with a 24 FPS average on battery, up 14% to 27 FPS on wall power, while the extreme showed a 42% advantage on battery at 33.4, which is a huge jump. And it had a 52% advantage on wall power. Even with the relatively strict power limits imposed when running on battery, the extreme has a huge advantage in the capability of its IGP in the majority of the titles we tested. Our original review of the Ally used the prioritized graphics preset for Resident Evil 4, but that turned out to be overly ambitious. So we downgraded to the minimum prioritized performance preset with FSR2 quality for this batch of tests. With those settings, the Z1 on battery starts at 23 FPS, up 18% to 27 FPS on wall power. As we've established thoroughly by now, the extreme has an advantage even on battery power, 36% over the non-extreme, with a 30.9 FPS average. As usual, the gap grows when connected to wall power with the Z1 extreme 48% ahead. That's another huge gap. It seems hard to justify the $100 cut for that much of a performance drop, though. Our usual CPU and GPU tests with the Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker benchmark use max settings. Even so, we haven't had any recently tested GPUs average below 60 FPS at 1080p, and that includes the RX 6400, the Intel Arc A380, and NVIDIA's 1650. Based on that, we kept the same 1080p max settings for testing the Ally. On battery power, the Z1 averaged 26 FPS, but with extreme stutters that kept both 0.1% and 1% lows while below that. It's not a good experience. Plugging it in achieved a 13% uplift to 30 FPS average, but with no improvement in lows, stuck at 10 FPS for even 1%. The extreme also had poor lows, but proportionally better than the Z1s, and average FPS was 22% higher on battery, and 32% higher on wall power. So then, at $100 difference, looking at a lot of these games, you're potentially losing a massive amount of performance. But the GPU busy metrics we saw, particularly with Baldur's Gate 3, show us an interesting insight into why specifically uh, we sometimes lose more performance in some games than others. So with Baldur's Gate, where we were not fully leveraging the GPU on the Z1 Extreme, that indicates that uh, because the GPU, which is one of the biggest advantages to the $100 more expensive option, was not being fully utilized, we end up more CPU constrained or memory constrained or what, something else other than the GPU, and that pushes these two devices closer together. So when we're more GPU bound, we see a, a much greater divergence. And in probably a lot of gaming scenarios, you're going to be GPU bound, but it does depend a little bit on the games you play. So. Uh, we tested some fairly intensive games here. So if you're going to play mostly two-dimensional games on these devices, like, say, Vampire Survivors, the differences won't be as great as in those heavily GPU-constrained scenarios that we're presenting. And that's because the GPU is the bulk of the meaningful difference, and that plots the biggest deviation between the two in our charts. So uh, if you play things that are primarily CPU-loaded, then it's less of a, a consideration, but if you will ever play things that are more GPU loaded, then uh, suddenly the extra $100 really does seem to buy you a lot of performance for the $100 bump. So maybe yes, it is a classic upsell approach, but it does appear that there's a more meaningful difference. And we're seeing double digit percentages, sometimes like 40% or more for the gap between these two when they're on battery. So to us, it seems like the Z1 non-extreme, you're really giving up a lot of performance. And for most people, 600 versus 700, 
it's it's easier for us to say yes, it's worth the hundred dollars in our opinions for someone who's going to be using that GPU. It's a different scenario than say um, like a forty sixty Ti eight gigabyte versus sixteen. You, you spend an extra hundred bucks, you get basically nothing useful in that scenario. In this scenario, you actually get something for it. On the other hand, a less expensive device that draws less power does make sense as an alternative to the Ally. Sorry, the Extreme Ally. And the Ally clearly can't take full advantage of its hardware in portable mode without massacring the battery life anyway. On the other, other hand, giving up such a massive chunk of potential performance for a 15% discount really isn't great. If there's any chance you're going to play docked, the Extreme is also a lot better. So that's it for the testing. The GV Busy stuff was really cool to see, and uh, we've been using it for discrete individual component reviews, but using it to look at a, a device where the user isn't selecting the parts and the manufacturer is doing it, that's really cool territory to get into because it helps to start telling us if uh, the parts they're choosing are well-balanced or not. Now, obviously, we can come to that conclusion through our own data set, by comparing individual part tests, but now we can put it all in one chart really easily. So it shows sort of the, the future of GP Busy and why we're so excited about it and answers whether or not these are well balanced for CPU and GPU pairings. But that's it for this one. Uh, pretty big difference for 100 bucks in most scenarios. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameraaccess.net to support us directly. And actually for the next couple of weeks, we are doing 10% of our store product sales donated to the local charity cat shelter cat angels and we've helped them with pc builds and things in the past so uh, we're doing that drive right now on store.gamersaccess.net or you just give it to them directly thanks for watching see you all next time